Hello, and welcome to the Talk to a Doc podcast. Today, our host, Katja Trent, a certified health coach and founder of Health Coaches of Kentucky, will have a conversation with a doctor about important wellness issues that can help you make a difference in your health. Hello and welcome to the Talk to a Doc podcast. Today we're going to have a wonderful show because I have a very special guest, Jack Norris. Jack is a registered dietitian and an animal activist. In 1993, he co-founded Vegan Outreach, a nonprofit organization promoting plant-based diet and compassion for animals. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jack. Thanks. I'm glad to be here, Katya. You have your bachelor degree in philosophy and psychology and later you became a registered dietitian so why did you change your occupation how did it happen right uh, the reason was that I would was traveling around the country during the mid 90s giving out our booklets at colleges and for vegan outreach and I encountered about one person each day who said that they had tried being a vegetarian or vegan and they hadn't felt healthy on the diet. And after discussing this with some of the people uh, at length, I felt frustrated that I didn't really know enough about nutrition to help them. I, of course, had read all the popular books on vegan nutrition and raw foodism at the time, but they didn't, they hadn't contained the answers for, for uh, these people. So. I decided I needed to study nutrition in a much more scientific way, and that's why I went uh, back to school to learn the science of nutrition and then get a degree in order to help such people. Well, that sounds wonderful. So have you learned the science? What's your recommendation today? Uh, well, I have done my best to uh, keep on top of the science, and you know, there's a lot of nutrition questions that aren't, that we don't necessarily have answers for, uh, but I do have enough knowledge to help some of the people that have had trouble with the vegetarian or vegan diet. Um, did you want me to go into that? or Yes. What? Well, first of all, briefly for those people who might maybe not heard about the, all the benefits of a vegan diet, maybe you can outline some and say, what is there one, one approach? Should everyone be vegan? Well, you know, I, I promote a vegan diet for ethical reasons so that people don't contribute to harming animals. And then there's a lot of other people that become vegan just to improve their health. And some of the major chronic diseases in the Western world can be uh, reduced uh, by eating a vegan diet. Vegans have much lower rates of type 2 diabetes. We vegetarians have lower rates of heart disease. We vegans have somewhat lower rates of cancer. So, and then we have lower cholesterol levels, lower body weight, lower rates of high blood pressure. So in terms of chronic disease, there's a lot of uh, benefits to a vegan diet. Now the issue comes, comes in with some people just, you know, people have a lot of various health related things going on and such as someone might be naturally not efficiently produce vitamin D. So they might have a little more trouble getting enough vitamin D than say your average person. And so that's where some of my some of my recommendations come in, just based on people's differences. Another one would be people, some people have a hard time absorbing iron, while others don't. And there's a, there's also some recommendations that all vegans should be aware of, such as taking vitamin B12. And I plan to go through uh, each nutrient in some detail, not a lot, but uh, if you want me to do that now, I could. I right, could do that. because one of my questions, you you on top of it, is uh, how important is it to supplement? When when you talk to people about switching their diet to a vegan, uh, plant based diet, some people get a little bit nervous and they believe that they might not be getting some nutrients because they're not going to be eating meat anymore. So yeah, what are the supplements? Right. So, I mean, there's two ways to go about it. It's possible to be vegan and not take any supplements and still meet the recommendations that I'm going to suggest. And taking supplements is just, in, in many ways, uh, an easy way to get the, the nutrients. So let me go through them. And you had asked me uh, if I supplement myself. And so I, I, what I do is I take a, a vi B vitamin complex. I take it mainly for vitamin B12. But I've also suspected, and, and this was even before I was vegan. Uh, I went vegan in 1988, 
but I was 21 years old at the time, and so I had had a still had 21 years of of uh, living, and at the time I felt as though I I needed possibly extra vitamin B2, which is riboflavin. And so I've continued to feel that getting more B2 than, than what's just in my diet is helpful to me. So I take actually a vitamin B complex, and that hits both vitamin B12 and B2. And then I also take zinc, iodine, and a calcium zinc magnesium supplement. And I take those uh, almost every day. Iodine I take about three times a week because you don't, you don't necessarily need it every day. Uh, but that is just me, and, and other vegans don't necessarily need to follow that same regimen, but I just wanted to you know, be clear on what I do. Vitamin B12 is something that, that vegans generally, uh, you should assume that if you're vegan, you need a source of vitamin B12 from fortified foods or supplements. So you could just get them from fortified foods, and you wouldn't need to, need to take a B12 supplement. If you do that, you should eat the fortified foods every day, and preferably actually a fortified fortified food twice a day rather than just once at different times because you mm -hmm. can only absorb so much B12 at one meal. So it's better to have it twice a day if you're doing fortified foods. Now, when you're taking supplements, you can take much higher amounts of B12. So you can just take it once a day. And if you take enough, you only need to take it twice a week. And that would be a thousand micrograms a day of B12. Let me ask you about B12 for kids, sure. uh, because I have kids and uh, I have not found a supplement specifically for kids. Is there a certain sub B12 which is just for kids, or is that okay to give them uh, like a little dose of an adult? Uh, you know, I would say that you should maybe opt for fortified foods would be the easiest way to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, I would take a uh, some B12 supplements come as low as 200 micrograms per per pill. Or tablet, and you could just uh, break that up into quarters if you need to. Mm -hmm. And you can smash a B12 pill and then just take a little bit. You know, you can divide it however many times you want. Once it's once it's in a more of a powder form, you shouldn't keep it in. If you do that, you shouldn't keep it in the light because light can damage B12 if it's exposed long enough. Mm -hmm. So you should just uh, keep it in the refrigerator or something if you do that. But yeah, you can take just about any B12 tablet and break it down as, as much as you want and I do have I have the amounts of b12 that are recommended for kids on my uh, veganhealth.org website uh, in the recommendations uh, well the recommendations have links recommendations for all ages I think the actual recommendation page lists only adults but if you follow the link it'll list what it what you need for kids right you you have amazing amount of resources on your website which is jacknorrisrd.com and here is also the vegan outreach of course has enormous amount of information so I encourage people to go and check them out and b12 is a is a subject of its own so um, yeah um, what about iron that's a good thing to talk about I had um, so let me uh, I'll talk about iron now iron can be a problem uh, particularly for vegan women who, and especially if they're long distance runners, because long distance runners tend to need more iron because of what happens when your feet strike the ground. It actually destroys red blood cells and you end up losing mm -hmm. more iron than you normally would. And then women who are menstruating are going to lose more iron. So generally this has not been a problem in research. Research has not found a problem among vegan men in terms of iron. But some, like I said, vegan women, and I've noticed it more anecdotally in endurance endurance runners, they can tend to get anemic. Oh. So the way, the, the best way to prevent that is to, one, drink a source of, well, eat or drink vitamin C with your meat. The way I do it is I just drink a small glass of orange juice with my oatmeal. Oatmeal is very high in iron, and vitamin C helps increase iron absorption from plant iron. Uh, it does quite a bit, actually, It's a, 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 to counteract the fact that plant iron is less absorbed um, than meat, iron in meat. So that's one way to do it. And then another way is to avoid coffee and tea at meals. Coffee and tea have polyphenols and tannin that prevent iron absorption. So you want to, if you have a problem eating with absorbing iron, then you shouldn't be drinking those beverages at your meals. 
Then let's see. So there's there's a number of other um, nutrients I want to talk about. Iodine, I briefly touched on the fact that I take. You you don't need to take an iodine supplement. You can eat seaweed, uh, and I would recommend eating it two to three times a week if that's where you're going to get your iodine. I don't generally like the taste of seaweed, so I don't eat it, but mm -hmm. uh, that is one way to get the iodine. Um, if you don't, then you can take, I take kelp supplements. They are just tiny pills made from kelp, and so I, there is iodine in plant foods, but it's very inconsistent. It really depends on what, how much iodine is in the soil. So it depends on where the food was grown. And it's uh, because it's inconsistent, and some research has shown vegans to have lower iodine uh, status than other diet groups, um, I recommend that vegans make sure they're getting enough iodine. Another nutrient. Let sorry, me ask you ahead. about iodine real quick. There is a iodized salt, I guess, that is not oh, a good right. source yeah, of it, iodine, right? No, it is. If you if you eat iodized salt, that's that's how you can get iodine. I think you need to eat about a quarter teaspoon a day, but I don't recommend that you add salt to your diet just to get iodine. Because generally, it's good to uh, to uh, keep salt on the lower end, right. unless you actually have low blood pressure. If you have low blood pressure, then eating more salt is fine. But generally, it's it's not a good idea to to purposely increase your your sodium intake. Uh, you should also know that you might eat a lot of sodium from prepared foods in restaurants or in uh, processed packaged foods. I mean, mm -hmm. but that that salt is not iodized, so you can't rely on that for mm -hmm. iodine. Okay. Uh, calcium is one that I think is, is probably, other than B12, I think it's the biggest one that vegans should be paying attention to because even though you can get enough calcium without taking supplements or eating fortified foods on a vegan diet just by eating lots of greens, leafy, uh, dark leafy greens, I don't think most vegans are eating enough, and so that's and I think they're just assuming they're getting enough calcium and that's not a great assumption so what you need to do is make sure you're eating three servings of dark leafy greens a day uh, that are high in calcium and low in oxalate so that's another part of the of the uh, issue with calcium is that if the food's high in oxalate such as spinach even if it has a lot of calcium it's not going to be a good source of calcium so the best leafy greens for calcium are kale collard greens turnip and mustard greens. Mm -hmm. Spinach and beet greens are not good sources because of the high oxalate content. And then there's a few other greens that are less well known that are somewhat in the middle, uh, some of them good. I'd actually have to look at a list because I, I don't remember them exactly off the top of my head which ones are low and high in oxalate, though I'd be happy to read that and it is on my website in many places. Um, right, I'm sure people can find that information. Yeah. Such as I think I think watercress is a good source. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't know if people eat, how how many people out there are eating a lot of watercress, <laughs> but it is available in, in most grocery stores in the U.S. to my knowledge. Okay, so let's see, vitamin D is the other one I did mention. Vegans, on average, their vitamin D status is a bit lower than meat eaters, but it's not below what's considered healthy. But every once in a while, I, I do run into vegans who have very low vitamin D levels, and that's true of meat eaters as well. Some people just don't make much vitamin D. Uh, you can make vitamin D by the action of sunlight on your skin. So if you don't get out on, in the sun much, and if some people don't seem to, to create vitamin D very efficiently, then... Um, vitamin D can be a problem. And usually if a vegan comes to me and they're, they're fatigued, it's either going to be iron deficiency or vitamin D deficiency. Um, th those are the most common reasons, I should say. In some cases, I am not able to figure out why they are fatigued, but in many cases, it's one of those two things. It's something to be aware of. And um, I, during the winter, I think it's good for vegans to take a 1,000 international units of vitamin D a day. Uh, you can get, that's not expensive, you can get almost an entire winter's worth for about $10. And um, then you can ensure that your vitamin D status stays <clears throat> high. Another um, nutrient of concern is beta carotene. Beta carotene is what, you're, is what uh, can be made into vitamin A, and that's how vegans get their vitamin A, because there's no, there's no uh, preformed vitamin A in animal foods. The trick to that is just to make sure you eat enough beta carotene. And I think most, well, I don't know about most, but many vegans are going to eat 
enough beta carotene without paying much attention to it because it's in carrots and other sweet potatoes and other orange vegetables and it's also in, in a number of green vegetables as well. But if you don't eat many of those, then you might be short on beta carotene. And I, even though I was aware of this uh, for many years, I think that I actually ended up getting low on my vitamin A status uh, because I started to find it harder to see at night. And then I realized I just happened to be reading up on, on beta carotene and thought, oh, you know what? I've kind of been neglecting beta carotene. I need to really make sure I get orange mm -hmm. vegetables in my diet every day. I started doing that. And then a, a, a month or so later, I just realized that I was seeing at night much more easily than I had been. Um, I'd actually run into a couple doors at night. It's why what Bradley brought that to my attention, and now that I can see at night quite easily, and, and that's lasted. So, you know, I, I don't I don't know for sure that it was beta carotene, but I highly suspect that it did make a difference for me. And I I am very conscious now, of making sure that every day I eat carrots or uh, some sweet potatoes or butternut squash or some other food that's high in beta carotene. And what about older people? Yeah, as people get older, their ability to absorb nutrients goes down in general. And so uh, things can become more difficult to, and their bodies become less, your, our bodies become less efficient to produce both vitamin D and omega-3s, uh, long, long chain omega-3s as we age. So um, yeah, it is something, I mean, older people should be aware of. Uh, uh, some of these nutrients, even more so than younger people. Uh, and speaking of that, zinc is one that uh, older people should be aware of and that also I think vegans, some vegans may not be getting enough zinc. I think I was one of those vegans. I used to get a, a, a cold once or twice a year. It would all typically last a week. And I would be very frustrated anytime I started to feel a cold coming on because I knew exactly <laughs> what was going to happen. I was going to get, it's going to start in my throat and then go to my, uh, my head and then down to my chest and then back up to my head. And then, it's, you know, it's going to be a whole week process. And I started taking zinc and um, I have not had a cold since then. And now I think it's been about four years now. And I've been really amazed, and boy, I take zinc religiously now because of how impressed I've been with the outcome of that. And and zinc is, vegans on average get about the RDA for zinc, but zinc is harder to absorb from plant foods. So we're at a slight, we're at somewhat of a disadvantage there. And I think if you're a vegan who doesn't get colds, then that's probably not any nothing to worry about. But if you do, that's one of the things I tell people is, if you get colds often, zinc. Right, it's a cold season right now, so zinc is something I'm going to take tomorrow right away. <laughs> yes. And I have some articles on zinc on my website for people who are more interested mm -hmm. in the details of that. And then the final thing was omega 3s. Uh, omega 3 fatty acids are, uh, it's kind of a long, complicated story, but they're short chain omega 3s, and those can be found in plant foods. Uh, they're not high in, in most plant foods, but there are a few plant foods that are high in omega-3s, and that would be flaxseed or flaxseed oil, chia seeds and chia seed oil, hemp seeds and hemp seed oil, uh, walnuts. Soy is actually decently high in omega-3 and uh, canola oil. So it, I try to keep a source of that. Uh, I would recommend eating some small amount of those foods every day to make sure you get omega-3s. I don't know if I'd really include soy in that because it's not – there's a small amount of, of it in soy, but not enough that I would feel comfortable recommending soy as your only source. Um, and what happens is then your body takes this, the short chain omega-3s and turns it into long chain, which the long chains that people have heard a lot about are EPA and DHA. And those are what are in the fish oil supplements. Um, there's a lot of controversy about fish oil supplements. It does not appear that they are beneficial and in the most rigorous research that's looked at them. But um, I am, I do recommend that vegans, if they find it convenient, take a DHA supplement of uh, two to 300 milligrams every one or two days, and especially older people, because as you age, your ability to turn the long chain, to create uh, the long chains out of the short chains becomes harder to do. 
Now, this is more theoretical than anything. We don't really know if um, we know that vegans, in most studies that have looked at it, vegans have lower levels of the long chain omega-3 DHA, and so uh, that is, you know, is somewhat of a concern. We have uh, vegans have lower blood levels of a lot of things, such as uh, cholesterol, and in most cases, that's a good thing. But um, because we don't really know what the lower level levels of DHA in our blood, whether it's having an impact on our tissues. I do recommend for now, until we know more, to take a DHA supplement. But again, many vegans, well, many vegans seem to do just fine without doing that, so I don't know how necessary it is, but um, it's something to be prudent about, I think. Well, that's very comprehensive. Thank you. This is great. Uh, people could have an understanding of what kind of supplements they need to look for if they are to be a successful vegans or successful in trying to improve their health even though it might sound a little bit complicated that you do have to take this supplement and that supplement overall it's really worth it because you're improving your health and uh, moving away from all these diseases and being more compassionate right and i should say that once again you can get all everything i mentioned you can get through food um, except for the B12. And, let, and in the case of B12, you could get it through fortified foods. You just have to make sure you're getting them. So I, I don't think that you have to take supplements. Um, but in many cases, it's just easier to do that. You just want to make sure sometimes. <laughs> you don't know what kind of quality food we get with our agriculture right. and other things with the environment and everything. When people ask you about the paleo diet, it does have meat in it, but it doesn't have much grains. And what's your response to that? Seems to be a very popular diet right now. What do you think? Oh yeah, it's definitely a popular di diet. I, I don't think you know. I don't think it's a good idea generally to try to um, base your diet on what our prehistoric ancestors <laughs> ate. You know, they didn't know what they were doing, and they just ones that survived survived. But um, they didn't necessarily eat an ideal diet, and there's many different types of ways that, that people during the Paleolithic era ate. Um, and one one thing that does seem to be very common among them is that they ate a lot of bugs and insects. And <laughs> so I think if you're really going to be serious about the Paleo diet, I don't think anyone really should be. Uh, there's there's no reason why people should be. But if you are, then that's something you should consider: is eating bugs and insects. Um, and there actually are some paleo people that are promoting uh, power bars made out of insects these days. So you can actually look into that. Yeah, That's you should funny. You Google it, find some. You know, the, the media likes to portray nutrition science as, as changing every few weeks. But that's not really, that has not been my experience. My experience has been since the, the 80s, uh, things have really been pretty consistent. Uh, you know, there's been some, some ideas that, that grew popular and then were found not to be so important. But generally the idea that eating a lot of saturated fat and eating a lot of simple sugars, you know, just processed sugars, you know, is not, is not a good way to go. And that's been, today that's still considered true based on the best research and that was considered true in the 80s. And, you know, there was the idea that maybe fish oil was real important and that's been debated back and forth, and, and for various reasons, there has been some evidence that it was uh, beneficial in some cases, and then there's evidence that it, it's not important. So there, there's a few things that, that, that have changed, but for the most part, the idea that people should be eating more plant foods, that whole grains are better than processed grains, but that whole grains are healthy, those sorts of things, that's pretty consistent in the, in the rigorous research. You know, I think paleo diets are somewhat of a response to the idea that, well, we don't even know what's right when nutrition is so, you know, it, it changes all the time. That, that actually isn't true. But if you're interested in reading more in-depth uh, discussion about what Paleolithic uh, era people ate, I recommend that you go to my blog, jacknorsardi.com, and just search paleo, and you'll find some articles and links to um, one blog in particular I thought was very good is called paleovegan.blogspot.com and because that might be hard to remember if you just go to jacknorsardi.com you can find it. We'll list all the links to what you're talking about below this uh, podcast absolutely because uh, I certainly will. I will read about that. That sounds very interesting. And I know you have a 
a vegan mentor program where you support people who need advice on how to transition or how to stick with a vegan diet. Could you share a few tips with us right. today on how to, if you are to try a vegan diet, how to not to fail, I guess, how not to feel like you're not doing the right thing? Well, re research has shown that people who, who transition more slowly are more likely to stick with it. So that's one thing to consider is maybe not try an all or nothing approach right away. What I like to do, rather than thinking of it as eliminating animal foods, I think of it as, as uh, adding plant foods and crowding out, which eventually crowds out animal foods. Start adding plant foods to your diet. And a good idea is to go for the higher protein plant foods because they're going to be satisfying in general. Um, and the high, the high protein plant foods are legumes of any kind, and um, which would include peanuts, beans, lentils, peas, soy foods such as edamame, tofu, tempeh, soy milk or soy meats, seitan, quinoa, pistachios, and pumpkin seeds. Those are generally the best sources of protein. And so if you, and I wouldn't just rely on pumpkin seeds either, that's not going to be very satisfying, but relying on the, the foods I listed at first, the legumes and say, seitan especially, that'll leave you satisfied. And don't wait uh, long to eat. So if you wait, generally the longer someone waits mm -hmm. to eat, the more they're going to go for the, the, uh, the quick calories. You know, an apple sounds decent when you're just mildly hungry. <laughs> when you get extremely hungry, you don't want an apple, you want a soda. You need some quick sugar fast. The, the best way to keep yourself from, from going down that road uh, where you can't just eat some beans for protein, you need a big chunk of meat, is to not wait so long. Yeah, so that, that's the main tips that I have. There's many you know ways to go about it, but those are the general rules that I would say lead to the most success. From your experience, how long does it take to transition fully to the plant-based diet? From my experience, it can take up to a year. Yeah, I think that a year's a good a good way to think about it to make the transition over at least a year. If not, I mean, some you know there might be an argument that someone should just become vegetarian over the course of a year and then maybe vegan over the course of another year. Um, I personally did it in the, that I became vegetarian in about seven months and then I became vegan after another three months but I was highly motivated I really didn't want to harm animals so I think I did it more quickly than maybe w I would recommend to other people because most people are becoming vegan for their health and surveys have backed that up I think it becomes a little harder to stick with it because you're you're um, when you do something for health reasons of course you can make exceptions here and there and and then if you don't watch yourself the exception can can uh, balloon into just going back to your old habits so sometimes it takes a few tries to stick with it and then um and then it sticks but you know at first it, it might be difficult uh to to get it on the first try anyway but i'd say just you know every day if you if you have one day that's you don't succeed and and uh just the next day, try again. And like I said, adding more plant foods is really the way to go. Think of it as, what am I going to eat today? And think of some good plant foods to eat. And um, and then you'll crowd out the animal foods and just keep doing that. Absolutely. And I think another part of it is a support. If uh, maybe a couple is trying to go vegan together, they are more likely to succeed That's rather than maybe one person out of the couple is trying to be vegan and so if you are to right. try to go vegan find someone to support you if you go to our vegan mentor program and you need someone else to talk to about being vegan that's what we we can provide you with someone who's been vegan for a while and can show you the outs and ends and just uh, especially if you're doing it for animal reasons then uh, sometimes people feel fairly lonely in the way they feel about animals because they look around them and they see others that don't care so much and just having someone to talk to about that can often get uh, lift your lift your spirits and make you realize that yes. you're not that that there's uh you know you might be somewhat different but that it's a good thing that you feel the way you do about animals. Right, absolutely, that's true. Well, Jack, thank you so much for this interview. This has been very educational, informative, and very very helpful. And I'm sure it will inspire some people to make uh, some changes. Well, I hope so. Thank you very much, Katya, for having me. Thank you for listening. If you like this episode, please rate and review it on iTunes. Visit my website, wellnesswithkatya.com, to learn more and subscribe to this podcast. If you have a specific question you would like me to ask a doctor during my next interview, email me at coach at 
wellnesswithkatya.com. It is K-A-T-Y-A for Katya. Thanks. Thank you.